The NFL draft is in the books and we're ready to break it all down on today's show. Today's episode, we're going to focus on wide receivers and tight ends. And I'm delighted to say, as well as having Sean Siegel here, we are also joined by Matt Hicks, who we had on around this time last year, one of our favorite guests from the draft season a year ago. You can follow him on Twitter at the FF underscore educator. Matt, welcome back into the show. And it's been a, we, we mentioned it just before we started, a busy weekend I don't know if we'll say disappointing weekend in terms of some of these landing spots, some of the way things played out over the the last kind of four or five days. But how are you feeling? And uh, I guess welcome back again. I'm feeling good, you know, very well caffeinated through this weekend. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it's been a roller coaster weekend, but that's kind of what you sign up for when you do this content. Right. So happy to ride the roller coaster and happy to to break it down a little bit Uh, with both of you guys here, you know, always always fun to jump on and, and chop it up with you two specifically. So I'm excited for it. Well, Matt, we're really excited to have you on and I'm excited to have you sort of shed some light on a few. I mean, there were some crazy picks, at least to my eye. And you know, as we kind of talked about before the show, uh, you probably are, are best positioned to, really give us some insights on a couple of those moves. Well, we're going to start out with some of the high profile people. Obviously that's where the most excitement is and where rookie drafts over this next week and this weekend, especially, and then, you know, hopefully for the next month and then we'll have another wave right before the season starts, but wide receivers. And obviously those four guys who go in the first round, what's the most notable thing about kind of how that first round played out specifically for the wide receivers were you surprised about the order that they came off the board? Do you think landing spots now really changed the calculus for anybody? What was your feeling about the first round? Yeah, you know, I think in terms of the four guys we saw, right, between JSN, Addison, uh, QJ, and Flowers, those were all guys we expected to go in that range. You know, there was a little bit of thought there that Johnston could fall into day two. Um, but instead he ends up getting the juiciest of the landing spots despite having the most questions, right? So that... That kind of made things complicated. But the biggest takeaway from those landing spots for me was um, Addison actually moving up to my wide receiver one. Um, I did not think I was going to get there. I'm a huge fan of JSN and I don't mind the Seahawks landing spot. You know, but if you look at JSN, he's now, you know, wide receiver three, maybe two in a run first offense uh, that, you know, solidified their, their want to run first with their second round selection versus uh jordan addison who now is in a really high volume projection for me he's in a kevin o'connell offense i think kirk cousins is a great stylistic uh quarterback for him right in terms of of what he was able to work with at the college level so um you know more excited about jordan addison leaving still perfectly happy about jsn um and you know it was a bummer with zay flowers Uh, a ravens projection is always going to be really tough so he slid down my board a little bit as well but you know, that, that's kind of my main takeaways from the first round. Nobody's surprising, but the landing spots definitely shifted value around. The things that we sort of debated on our rookie ranking summit yesterday for the RV rookie guide was Addison versus Dalton Kincaid with him landing, obviously in Buffalo. We've had a few guests on the show who, I mean, I don't think anybody is necessarily out on Addison, but felt like maybe some of the production was softer i guess is a way to put it than for some of the other guys and that that maybe there were red flags i don't necessarily feel that way but when you say that he's your number one i'm was wondering i mean what are the points for him where you're really jumping out there and saying i mean i love this guy now yeah so i mean jsm was my wide receiver two coming in i definitely like or i'm sorry addison was my wide receiver two coming in and i like i said i definitely love jsn tape right but for me i place a strong emphasis on when i plug him into my seasonal projections i put a strong emphasis on that year one production and it's not necessarily because i believe a wide receiver can't hit in year two or three but I mean, look at the major swings in value that we see for guys that do produce year one, right? Uh, think about the way we feel right now about Garrett Wilson compared to Traylon Burks. Now, those guys, their ADP wasn't that far off last year, right, compared to each other. So, you know, for me, that's really in terms of fantasy value, why I'm pushing Addison up. Um, but I do think these guys in rookie drafts are, are going to be in a sub tier of their own. You know, I'm calling that in a super flex draft that 106, 107. 
I'm calling it the wide receiver one tier because it's going to be a debate between those two guys. Um, but they should go off the board next to each other still. There's always those challenges. Sean mentioned, obviously, the guys doing the draft guide with the the, the rookie summit at Rotoviz. But there's always the challenges then of how much maybe – in terms of the film you mentioned heading in, we like some of these guys also where they go in the NFL draft and then how teams actually feel about them and the draft capital that, that they give up to get these guys. So like the likes of a, a Jonathan Mingo or a Rishi Rice finding pretty good spots there. Is there one of those guys that is the hit moving forward? Is there one of them that you would have more confidence in, again, as a rookie and for their NFL career out of those two? And, and should we be more excited now than we than we were a week ago yeah i think we should be more excited but i'm still proceeding with caution with both john <laughs> and rashi rice yeah i know i'm trying to pump some excitement in here you know for me mingo is is a little bit more interesting in terms of you know he was somebody that i really liked as a deep sleeper like i was going to target him in the fourth round of my rookie drafts i expected him to go day three and, and hoped he would get kind of a good landing spot right but now he goes to the top of day two Right. So he's on everybody's radar. He's probably going to be an early second round uh, rookie draft selection. Right. Um, you know, he's a great boundary presence. He's super athletic. If you watch his tape, man, like he has the ability, like he'll catch anything in his vicinity, like great off target pass catcher. And those are things that, you know, get me excited in terms of his projection. But if you look at what Carolina is doing here, I think it's a smart NFL roster building move. They're bringing in Adam Thielen, right? A possession type guy. DJ Chark, take the top off the defense type guy. Now they're bringing in Jonathan Mingo, a boundary receiver guy who could be a little bit more of a physical presence and hopefully a red zone. Uh, they brought in Hayden Hurst this offseason, right? So what I think they're doing is bringing in a lot of different weapons, seeing what Bryce Young clicks with, and they're going to lean into those types of receivers, you know, as they get into year two or three and kind of sign upgraded version of or draft upgraded version of these guys. So from a roster building standpoint, I love it. It reminds me of what the Buffalo Bills did with Josh Allen, but I'm not going to get attached to Jonathan Mingo, despite the fact that you can get a, a decent projection for him year one, just proceeding with a little bit of caution on him. Um, in Rashi Rice, it feels like you got to pay the Kansas City tax, right? He, there, his ADP is going to go up an extra half round just because he's with Kansas City. So not going to lean into him in early second round where I have already seen him go multiple times. I just don't know that the upside is there in the way that they're going to spread out the ball. And remember, if you're wide receiver one in Kansas City, you are still by far target number two in that offense behind Travis Kelsey. Yeah, and that's the thing. Wide receiver one there is, like you're saying, the wide receiver one in Kansas City is, is Travis Kelsey. Uh, right. When we look around, uh, it, it feels like, and you touched on with Carolina there, it feels like and most of the teams in the NFL this week made quite smart roster building decisions sometimes that's not the case we can we'll not get into the houston texans just yet and, and what they did overall but um i'm a packers fan i uh, want to find out a little bit here about Jaden reed mixed reviews coming in um you know there was an option to possibly have jsn there and then when we're talking about this there's also my thought process was like he could potentially have been the wide receiver tree in green bay based on some of the the depth charts that we would still have at the moment but we look at Jalen Reed let's say he is wide receiver three there now but what is your thoughts on him moving forward and what is the potential upside yeah I like Jaden Reed you know he had a good tape evaluation from me nice boundary guy he's got good speed on the outside he can take the top off a of defense it does kind of sound like I'm already describing another wide receiver on the on the Packers though right so it'll be interesting to see kind of how they play out but I do like Jaden Reed. He had a pretty strong projection for me. He came in in that wide receiver three, four seasonal value, which, you know, is pretty good for somebody that went in his pick range. Um, so decent draft capital, decent seasonal projection. What worries me about Jaden Reed and just really the Green Bay Packers overall is kind of similar to what I was saying with Mingo, except the Packers did it all through the draft, right? You take Reed, you take Musgrave, you take Kraft, you take Dontavian Wicks, who I really like as a late round pick. Um, and then they, I think they added somebody else at the end too. I'm forgetting. I think it was another wide receiver there at the end. There's so, going to be a lot of, there's, they're leaning heavily on very young players and that, that might work in two or three years, but the likelihood of those guys all coming in and clicking in year one is extremely low. Right. And they're just, and that, I think they're uh, just throwing it at a wall pressure. and with sticks, right? So. Exactly. And that also puts more pressure on the rookies to actually, you know, sink or swim. So it'll, it's either one of those things and it'll either look really good or look really, really bad. Right, exactly. Yeah, that one is one that I had 
a little bit of trouble with. And it does seem to me like it really boosts Christian Watson. So we'll see how that plays out. But we do have this other sort of group of small receivers who, I mean, I think they went in a very realistic range based on what we knew coming in. But you have Marvin Mims, Jalen Hyatt, Josh Downs. These guys are all small. They all went, I mean, I would say toward the bottom of their likely ranges. Although, you know, some people were not as high on Mims as basically we are and and all the guests have been. Um, Do these guys as late second to mid third round picks? I mean, we know that's already, especially when you're talking about third round picks into a range where, I mean, you're not necessarily (laughs) expected to hit. These are already starting to move into flyers. But when you're talking about guys who are very productive and would seem to have, at least specific niches that maybe they would fit for. Do you like these guys as being able to come in and it fits with their team, make instant impacts? Yeah, all three of these guys are on my radar. You know, I'm looking to draft all of them at different value points. You know, for me, Marvin Mims is, is the real guy who sticks out out of this group. I'm a, in terms of value, I'm a big fan of Marvin Mims. I liked his tape a lot coming out, you know, separates consistently. Uh, especially into the deep third of the field, really sticky hands. I believe he averaged like over 17 yards per reception, if I'm remembering correctly, at Oklahoma. It was a very high number um, and kind of was the dude in that offense. So he was always pulling top coverage. So when you look at Marvin Mims, you plug him into Denver, uh, and at first you're like, ah, I'm not sure how this fits, but Denver's already come out. They said they see him as either a Z or, or a Y receiver. And so I think he slots in right away into that slot role, And in Denver, you know, you could probably get 75, 80 targets out of that. Mims does have the ability to play on the outside as well. And Denver spent all offseason, you know, very open with the fact that they're willing to trade Jerry Judy, you know, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick. I think at least one of these guys is going to be gone by the time we hit week one. And then Mims's projection gets even higher from there, right? So I think for me in terms of landing, and he lands with Russell Wilson. And I know Wilson didn't have the season we wanted last year, but that's still a good quarterback landing spot at the end of the day, right? So I'm a big fan of Mims. Hyatt, you know, he came in uh, pre-draft as my wide receiver three. You could call it take lock. You could call it what you want, but he's still in the mix for me. Um, You know, in that kind of not the top tier of of receivers, but that next tier down kind of betting on talent, you know, in, in my evaluation process. But the other thing is, you know, although definitely did not get the draft capital that I wanted, he did land in an offense where he can be the wide receiver one, right? I mean, he's battling for targets now with Isaiah Hodgkins, Darius Slayton, um, and, you know, Wandale Robinson. other wide receivers. Right, yeah. And so it's like, yeah, and, you know, the joke is that Jalen Hyatt might have upped the average weight of, of that wide receiver room, right? But, um, and he has the ability to lead in, in touchdowns as well. So, you know, it, it might, it's not as clean of a projection as I would have liked it for B, but I'm still willing to get Hyatt, especially if you can get him at a late second round value. You know, that's really nice for me. And then the last guy you mentioned is Josh Downs. I love the landing spot in Indianapolis. You know, you're looking at an offense that has two good boundary guys on the outside. It's going to open up the underneath and the seam for Josh Downs to do what he did best at Carolina, except Josh Downs had to do it as the guy. So now he's not going to have to do it as the guy. Um, And I think, you know, he's still a slot projection, but I think he's a higher end slot projection. And if Anthony Richardson does hit, then all of a sudden now we have we have a really dynamic guy uh, in this offense. So I like all of these guys. You're probably getting them anywhere from 204 to, to, you know, even into the third round 302. You know, you could even see Hyatt slide as far down or down. So um, I I like it. That's where I start to get more optimistic about this rookie draft is when we get into this range. Matt, you mentioned Hyatt there in a positive light, and I've been very high on him the whole way. I I certainly was hoping he would go earlier than he did, and yet there are some positives about the landing spot. The concern as I'm getting it from a lot of the community and perhaps even the NFL draft community is that Tennessee's offense, number one, is not – necessarily what you consider pro style offense and number two that Hyatt was sort of protected and they manufactured a lot for him you obviously do a ton of tape work what's your feeling on how his game will translate I mean for me when I'm looking at the production and I'm looking at the athleticism I'm thinking NFL defenses are also going to have trouble with this guy yeah, you know, I've watched a lot of Jalen Hyatt over the last year. You know, bias, you know, bias alert. I am a Tennessee alum and a Tennessee fan. So I'm watching Jalen Hyatt week in and week out. 
And for me, you know, I think people put on the tape, they saw the speed and they labeled him as a speed guy in, like you said, a very college friendly offense. I think there's more nuance to his game than folks are willing to give him credit for. I really like his release. If you look at when he had to produce, when he was best, it was when Cedric Tillman was out. So Jalen Hyatt was the only guy. His best game of the season was a four-touchdown performance against Alabama, who has some of the best secondaries in, in the NFL, and they knew they were throwing him the ball. So Hyatt has the ability to separate and find space, even when the defenses are locked in on him, right? So, yes, he had a friendly offense. Like, yes, that production only came in one year, right? Um, but I like the handwork and he became more physical over the course of the season. Right. And so that's going to help him, I think, translate uh, physically to the NFL game as well. So there is upside for me. Um, and like I said, you know, who, who are you going to project for more than five touchdowns in the Giants offense right now? Right. Like maybe Darren Waller. So if, if Hyatt can get six of those as a rookie, all of a sudden, you know, he is the dude. And it, it's not, you know, I know third round draft capital isn't what we wanted from Jalen Hyatt. But it's not like we've never had a wide receiver produced from the third round, right? So it's for me, it's very much within the realm of possibility. I don't love that his consensus uh, value is lower right now. But for me, that's just an opportunity to get value in my rookie drafts and to take advantage of that. So call it take lock, call it what you will. But I'm not going to back off of Jalen Hyatt, especially if I can get him late second round, early third. Yeah, all day. Yeah, we're not going to criticize that at all. That's That's <laughs> music to our ears. And then we go into this group that I mean, we transition from this fun group of small receivers who were good to some names where, I mean, Matt, you're going to have to help us out here. We got Michael Wilson, Trey Tucker, Darius Davis. They're all going that 90 to 125 range. And again, I mean, that's already in the range where you're actually not expecting production, but you would expect NFL teams to take interesting flyers. To me, these seem like, throwaway picks in a range where if you're going to make a throwaway pick just like trade down and get value into future years you could trade out of the pick entirely and get you know a mid third third and fourth next season as opposed to throwing it away but i'm guessing that i mean obviously nfl teams see some traits with these guys that they like yeah and you know i i don't like to be this guy i'm not the one that sits here and tells you oh next year's class next year's class but if you do get to a point in the draft where you just stop feeling good about it, you know, third round, even if you could swap a mid third this year for a third next year, it's not the worst idea. Uh, that being said, you know, there is some opportunity with each of these guys. Some I like more than than others. Michael Wilson to me is really interesting. You know, very athletic wide receiver, really good film. It was just limited. Michael Wilson, I, I believe, had an injury three years in a row at Stanford, and he was highly recruited. He was a high four star recruit. That Stanford offense just wiped away any potential for guys to look fun over the last couple of years. It was a very boring vanilla offense. I mean, Tanner McKee was at the helm of it, so that should tell you what you need to know about it. But Michael Wilson did pop good hands, good uh, vertical ability, and, and some nice yards after catch potential. So when he lands with Arizona, he lands in an offense that is in a ton of flux, right? I still expect Hopkins to get traded at some point in time. And then, you know, who do you have there really taking up targets? Rondell Moore and, you know, you kind of struggle to name too many more guys on that depth chart. Now, the quarterback play is going to be suspect over the next year, but I think Wilson does have the opportunity to have some staying power. That being said, I don't want to use more than a fourth round pick on him in my rookie drafts, but there's a little bit there. Um, Trey Tucker for me, I'm out on Trey Tucker. You know, for me, he's very much a traditional slot. And I know that he got some nice draft capital, but I just don't, I, I couldn't give him any, any kind of relevant volume projection. Darius Davis is interesting. You know, I wouldn't say any more than a mid to late fourth round flyer interesting, but he is fast. I did like his tape and he can play well along the boundary. So I know he's smaller, but he's not going to be pinched into the uh, a slot only role. I will say to proceed with a little bit of caution on his draft capital because the Chargers drafted him at that price to be a special teams guy, right? He's a great punt returner. He's a great kick returner. Uh, he has multiple touchdowns at the college level. I believe multiple touchdowns in each of his collegiate seasons, you know, as a kick returner. So if your league does give points for that, that's reason to go up and get Darius Davis. Um, otherwise, you know, it, the, the appeal is that he's probably wide receiver four or five on an offense and guys get injured, right? So maybe as a guy who's going to make the 53-man roster on special teams, he could just, as the season goes on, kind of find himself into some targets. 
I, uh, I was going to add that in, but you beat me to it. For people playing out there with uh, points per special teams, uh, there's the the differences and variations in leagues. Now I'm sure there's people listening that will uh, be adding that to their their notebook moving forward. Listening to where we are with those guys, it might not be a case where there is a favorite sleeper when we're getting deeper than that. But if you are in the fourth round of your rookie draft, anyone standing out for you there, the likes of Washington or Palmer, maybe Perry. It's uh, yeah. It's slim pickings, so though. At that point, these might be guys you're looking on, you know, the waivers before the season. Yeah, this is, you know, a range. Again, you're going to use fourth round picks on the guys we just talked about and the guys that we'll talk about now. So I'm, I'm not overly concerned about leaning into day three guys versus some guys who went uh, late day two. Uh, I really like Puka Nakua uh, out of BYU. He's kind of been my guy all the way through the process. Uh, you know, plays really well along the boundary. He's physical, creates separation. He had five rushing touchdowns last season. So, you know, Debo Samuel light, um, not to not to throw names around, but, you know, maybe very light. And he lands in the Rams offense, right, which is has volume potential. There's really not that much there taking up uh, volume past Cooper Cup, of course. Um, and then, you know, it's Sean McVay. So it's a creative minded offense for a versatile player. So that one gets me excited. Um, you know, I, I like Parker Washington in terms of tape review and he has versatility so he can play all over the field. Which again, you know, when you're projecting somebody who's just going to make the roster, having versatility gives him a better chance of doing that. So I'm willing to take that late round flyer on um, Parker Washington as well. And then I'll give a shout out, you know, for for your guy as a Packers fan, Dontavian Wicks. You know, we talked about how how um, packed that depth chart is now, but D- Dontavian Wicks, you go back to 2021, man, had some of the best film in college football at the wide receiver position. Super athletic. You know, great contested catch guy, good speed for his size, you know, feels the boundary very well. You know, uh, offensive uh, scheme change, coaching staff change into 2022 did not have awesome tape. You know, we saw issues with drops and that's kind of where he fell. But, you know, going into the season, Wicks was, you know, thought of as kind of like a top 50 type guy. So, you know, things change and obviously draft capital is low, but I wouldn't mind taking a shot on him late as well. Do you have any thoughts on the Princeton fellow here? Yeah, Ashivas, you know, I I like Ashivas. You know, he was somebody I thought could sneak into day two because of that athleticism. Uh, and you look on tape, man, like big body, he's raw. Um, I don't like the landing spot in Cincinnati, right? Uh, because I think for Ashivas to get on the field, he's probably playing in the T. Higgins role. Um, and, and that's not really going to be, a, uh, you know, a legitimate projection that we can make. Uh, Charlie Jones, who landed in Cincinnati, is, is the guy that I am much more interested in. I think Charlie Jones plays very well. He's one of my sleepers. And he plays like Tyler Boyd. Like, stylistically, it's almost the same. We've heard Cincinnati might, you know, is going to be looking to move on from one of these wide receivers. They've doubled down on keeping T. Higgins long term. So I think it's Boyd who's going to get the boot. Um, and I think them drafting Charlie Jones uh, as a stylistic replacement is, is another indication of that. Tyler Boyd is uh, the road of his overtime OG. And he, there is a point here where he's going to have to be phased out. So maybe we already have his replacement in Cincinnati. Sean, we'll, we'll keep close tabs on that over the next few months. Moving on, though, to tight end. And this was a class coming in where there was you know a lot of positive conversations around the actual draft capital for a lot of these guys pretty positive coming out off the the last couple of days the one surprise probably that Mayer did slide a little bit in this draft How, were you surprised that he fell and then the likes of Laporta and Kincaid how did you feel with their landing spots and I guess with the the landing spot that Kincaid got it feels like there is some potential there for him to be an immediate star in the NFL yeah, you know, and not to give a shameless puck, but on the Rookie Big Board YouTube channel, I just put out a video today to kind of try to give an idea of the different tiers I saw breaking out in rookie drafts. And both Meyer and Kincaid fall in the, the tier I call the drop-off, right? It's after the 107, pretty much the 108 to 112. None of it feels like, you know, like you're, you're investing the right price. Um, and, and we get hesitant in non-tight end premiums to invest in tight ends early. But, you know, I'm willing to, to lean into Mayer and Kincaid in that 108 to 112 range. I like both of them for different reasons. Obviously, Kincaid gets a little bit more of that draft capital. Um, I, I know folks tend to appreciate when a team trades up to get somebody. You know, it, it suggests extra value. Um, and Kincaid is a great pass catcher. Uh, for me, though, you know, 
uh, the the year one projection is good. I'm trying not to get carried away with it because I, I you know, do think that they still like Dawson Knox. I think he'll still, you know, get on the field. And obviously we still have Stefan Diggs there, you know, like it or not, Gabe Davis is still going to pull touchdowns in that offense. Right. So trying to proceed with a little bit of caution, but I definitely think, you know, uh, Kincaid is somebody who into year two, into year three, we could start talking about him as a, like a top five or six dynasty tight end. He definitely has that skill set and that potential. You know, maybe like a la Dallas Godair when he's doing the best, you know, kind of when he's at his peaks, but Kincaid might be able to hold that a little bit longer. Michael Mayer for me, you know, he was my tight end one coming in and he does hold that tight end one uh, spot, despite the fact that he fell into the second round. You know, I'll just take a quick second to point out that my draft capital buckets aren't purely based on rounds. And actually the bucket that I use is pick 20 to 50. So, so Mayer and Kincaid to me both have the exact same draft capital and Mayer comes in with a really nice uh, projection. You look at what he brings to the Raiders offense compared to everything else that's there. Less competition as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, is, is Hunter Renfro going to take targets from him? So he's going to step in and be the day one starter at tight end. He's going to be on the field. He's going to get a lot of snaps because he's a great blocker as well. But I think he's going to be the red zone guy. You know, if you're not throwing to Devontae Adams in the red zone, right, you're throwing it to Michael Mayer. So he could get uh, five, six touchdowns, which historically is a very large number for touchdowns as a rookie, right? And you know you only need to pop a little bit as a rookie tight end to have an extreme value increase in year one, right? Because it's so desperate there. So either one of these guys, late first round selection, I am totally good with it. Well, how about Laporta then, where you have production, you have athleticism, you have a surprise draft pick, and I mean, evidently Jamison Williams is using his gambling devices in the wrong places, and so <laughs> you know you can get off to a little bit of a fast start. I mean, we wouldn't expect rookie tight ends to be like getting off to a fast start, but it could be a little bit of a unique situation in Detroit. Yeah, no, I definitely like Laporta too. And, you know, uh, somebody just sent me a screenshot of their draft and Laporta went at 301. And I was like, dude, that is a smash value all day. You know, I, I would absolutely love that. You know, he's coming out of a boring offense, so you might not, you know, uh, really see all the potential in Sam Laporta, but he's super athletic. He has really great hands. Iowa lined him up all over the field. And I think Detroit's going to want to do that as well. Uh, and as you alluded to, you know, past Amon Ross St. Brown, there's really nobody commanding volume in that offense year one. I mean, guys, how many times did we have to see a, a meaningless notification about a Brock Wright touchdown last year, right? So now we can get that to Sam Laporta, somebody who's actually exciting. And, he, you know, he plugs in as a tight end, you know, two, like a like tight end. I think it was like uh, 18 or, or, or 20 in that range in my projections year one, which, as you mentioned, like, that's good. We'll take that from a rookie tight end. Absolutely. So then we get into the weird part. And I mean, Musgrave, to an extent, I, I think people anticipated with the athleticism there, even though, I mean, you've got to project a little bit in terms of what the production actually was. But then we have a host of, we call them strange names. Uh, help us understand what the NFL was doing with this next group of tight ends. You know, I've been trying to help folks understand over the last couple of months that the NFL loves this tight end class. And I think we saw that with a couple of tight ends going early. And then I, I feel like the floodgates just opened up where every team was like, man, if we're going to get one, like, we got to get one. Um, and so Luke Musgrave made sense to me. And I actually really liked the loose Luke Musgrave landing spot until they took Tucker Kraft too. <laughs> and, and to me, not only was that like a volume split, but it was like, were you not that confident <laughs> in the first pick you made? Or did you just really like both of these guys? Um, you know, so I, I'm okay with Musgrave still. You know, I would wait until the third now, unless you have like a super premium in your league uh, at the tight end position. But that's kind of the guy for me. You know, I, I'm not into Luke Schoonmacher. Um, I think Jake Ferguson has just as much of a chance to win targets in that offense. And I, and I like Jake Ferguson a ton coming out of last year's class, you know, Brenton strange. I'm really not even entertaining it with Evan Ingram there. I, like, you know, pun intended a very strange pick, like you said. So, you know, there, there's really not much there for me. Um, you know, we, you know, if you're, if you're doing five, six rounds, I could give you some names of guys that I kind of like, like Cameron Latu, I think is sneaky, interesting. And, and he got day two draft capital, but you know, for the most part, I would say, you know, hone in on, on Mayer, Kincaid, uh, Laporta. You know, I'm not totally ruling out Darnell Washington. If you want to use a, a mid to late third round pick, that was tough medical uh, related, even tougher because he lands in Pittsburgh where we already have Frermuth. So, 
you know, I don't love that landing spot, but I still believe in, in Washington as a talent. Um, but I would say still focus on the top of the class for sure. You mentioned the medical there. Can you give us a little bit of context in terms of like, what that is for listeners? And then I think that's something that people are also interested in is like, is it a chronic type of concern? Is it something that has happened is, and the player is going to have to recover from? I mean, both of those things can be problematic, but I think when you see interesting production in a, on like a per route basis, and then you see someone destroy the combine, a lot of people are going to be thinking, well, if the, if the injury predates that, then I don't actually care. And I'm glad that he dropped a little bit and I can take advantage. Yeah, you know, uh, Washington was an interesting one because there were some other guys that dropped and, and we kind of thought they might, right? Like a Tajay Spears. We knew there was something about that knee. It turned out to be worse than we thought, right? But Darnell Washington, we didn't really have this indication. And the way that the uh, that medicals work, you know, for NFL teams is if a medical team red flags you for medicals, that means you're off the board, right? You're not down their board. So some teams, to my understanding, some teams saw Darnell Washington's knee identified an issue, took them off the board. Other teams like the Steelers said, you know, we don't think this is a significant concern. And I think the Steelers, you know, doubled down with that by taking a, somebody who was not a position of need was still day two draft capital, right? So I do think that they like him. My only concern with Washington, it's not so much the medicals. It's that they, they're going to like him so much as, as a blocker because they already have Frermuth who can, you know, be a pass catcher that he may end up only being, you know, a red zone you know, red zone primary target type guy. So you mentioned Latu. Give us 30 seconds on him and, and any other like deep sleeper that you're fired up about. Yeah. Yeah. Cameron Latu, you know, he was recruited as an edged at Alabama, played linebacker and then switched to tight end. And so he has that athletic versatility, great pass catcher, navigates around the field well and has really good hands. He's also not afraid to put his hand down and smash, right? So he's very much in the George Kittle mode mold. And I think if he pops, you know, we're, we're thinking two, three years down the road here, right? But, you know, George Kittle is a physical guy that misses time a lot, right? And so to invest a late day two pick, I know San Francisco also invested a late day two pick on a kicker, right? So maybe that doesn't say anything. But, uh, you know, there, there's enough there for me where, especially if you're going five, six rounds or have a big premium, Latu should be in play. Awesome stuff. And uh, we are fortunate enough that we are going to have Matt back for running backs and quarterbacks on the Wednesday edition of the podcast. I mentioned at the start Matt's Twitter handle at the FF underscore educator, but you mentioned the rookie big board over on YouTube and some of the work you've done since the NFL draft, obviously a lot of stuff before the NFL draft, but where can the listeners find you? Have you anything you want to share? You mentioned shameless plugs earlier. Don't be afraid to shamelessly plug yourself. The floor is yours. Yeah, man. Rookie Big Board on all your audio platforms as well as YouTube. You know, I'd, I would encourage folks, if you need help in your rookie drafts, you can head on over to patreon.com slash rookie big board. You know, I have full rookie rankings updated. We have a discord, you know, where we have an on the clock channel. We help you as you go through the draft. And what's cool is it's not just me. It's, it's everybody in our community. We have like 200 plus people that chime in and give insight and advice. And I did drop like a hundred page rookie guide as well. So all of that is just three bucks. So if you want to head on over to patreon.com slash rookie big board, I will, uh, after this weekend and all the work, I'll, I'll happily shamelessly plug it. Awesome stuff. Busy time for you. We are going to have you back, though, on the Wednesday edition. Looking forward to that. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Over to Marland. Of course, Sean has a lot of post NFL draft along with the rest of the Road of His team up on RoadOfHis.com. You can check all that out. If you are signing up, you can use the code RV Radio 2023 at checkout to save yourself 10% while signing up to a one year pass. Check all that out. That is RoadOfHis.com. And until we are back, have a good one.